musicians, uh, singers that desire to teach us truth as they sing. And uh, that's a new song. I've not heard that song, but that was a, a great encouragement as we thought about the gospel through every part of that song. And uh, that's really important today in our churches, that we sing songs that are doctrinally rich, that, that remind us of truth, the truth of the gospel. And so I really appreciate that and thankful for all of our musicians who really uh, pray about what God would have them to sing and that they would communicate the message of the gospel uh, in that. Well, today uh, we're going to start with a little bit of a reminder. How many of y'all remember the great water scare of 2016 here in northern Alabama? Am I the only one? Was I from an alternate universe or something? Yeah, over in, was it Lawrence County or Morgan County? Or, no, not Morgan County. We, we didn't have the water problem, right? Right, Mark? Mark Cups works with the water department along, along with some others and and, uh, you know, there's a big scare in the, uh, in the communities. You know, is our water contaminated? Are we going to glow green? Uh, you know, is, is all of our hair going to fall out? And we were really worried about our water um, and whether it was contaminated or not. And, and the big reason for why we were concerned is because, you know, it's always good to double check and make sure you've got your sermon notes when you get up to preach. Where did my sermon notes go? This is not good. I think I left them in the bathroom behind the elevator. Dwayne, would you go get my sermon notes for me? That is not good. But I don't need them for this portion, but I will need them here in a little bit. I'm always worried. And you might say, Pastor, you don't need sermon notes. And I don't know if you've ever seen a preacher who uses no notes at all. It's like, man, how do they do that? I'm always worried I'm going to get up here and say, bleep, bleep, bleep. That's all, folks. Well, not bleep in the way you're thinking, but porky pig bleep. That's all, folks. This is not going well. See, I need my notes. But anyway, um, the reason that the water scare was so dangerous is because, you know, they both look the same. They're, 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 there's no way you can tell whether one cup of water is deadly or one cup of water is delightful. You know, there was no way to tell that without a certain uh, test, without a certain way to test the water. And so people were really scared about that. Well, about a year and a half ago, um, I started to try to get more healthy in my life, as many of you know, and I've released uh, about 46 pounds in that journey. And uh, one of the things that I really resolved to do as I did that was to drink lots more water, to drink a lot more water. And really, that was going to become my primary beverage. How many of you have ever made that decision in your life to drink more water rather than more Dr. Pepper or Mountain Dew? or soda. And I don't see Dwayne coming back, so maybe I do have my notes. Let me see. That's the problem. I st How many of you stuff your Bibles? How many of you stuff your Bibles with lots of stuff? Hey, uh, let's see. Where's uh, Brother Matthews? Would you go back to this back area and see if they're there? This morning's message is going to be on the pastor finding his sermon notes, wherever they might be. They might be back in the music room. This is so embarrassing. I tell you, where did they go? Anyway, um, see, I, I'm not stalling, really. Actually, I've got a little uh, display I want to share with you this morning, a little science experiment, because about a year and a half ago, I decided, well, listen, if I'm going to start drinking a lot of water, then I better make sure that I'm putting the best water in me that I possibly can. So should I just drink water straight from the tap? Did you find them? Give Brother Dwayne a round of applause and Butch. We are uh, nominating deacons over the next several weeks, and these deacons just secured their spot for another few years. <laughs> so we're so thankful for that. Oh, and by the way, take out your worship guide. We have some notes for you to follow along in the message today. Thank you as well, Brother Matthews. You found last week's sermon notes. Amen. You'll never know what you find in this church. But anyway... Um, as I was uh, thinking about the, 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 the whole water scare and, and thinking about the kind of water we put in our body, uh, I started to discover that not all bottled water is the same and not all tap water is the same. In fact, there's a great difference between one bottled water and another. How many of you have ever researched the acidity of certain water and the alkalinity of other waters, all right? And I did a lot of research into this and became very, you know, just uh, kind of nerdy on this. I mean, I watched YouTube videos of, of this one lady testing 24 different bottled waters, and she used this little thing called a pH tester. Now, a lot of us use this in a pool setting to make sure that the pH level of our pools is correct. 
but uh, you can also test for drinking pH levels. And they say that the more acidic water is, the more tendency you have to be sick. They also say that a, uh, th that a, higher, that a higher acidity level can also potentially lead to more uh, possibility of cancers in your body. And so obviously I was thinking, man, if the main beverage I'm going to be putting in my body is water, I want to make sure it's the healthiest possible water of all. And so as you look at these two glasses of water, they both look the same and they both are pure. They are both clean, but they're still not the same. So let's just do a little test here. Put three drops in there. Three drops in there. Do you see any difference? It might be hard to see in the light, but this water is yellow. This water is blue. Why is that? Well, what this, uh, what this tool, what this pH tester is showing is that one water, the yellow one, is more acidic than the blue one. And actually, the healthiest of the two options here before us would be to drink this water. And shameless plug, this is a brand called Essentia. Now, I can't afford to buy $2 bottle, $2 liters of water every day, so I found a water filter and an ionizer and an alkalizer that made this kind of water, and that's what I've been drinking for the last year and a half, and quite interestingly enough, I've gotten sick a lot less, okay? So that's the only plug today in the science experiment, but I want you to see, the point is, I want you to see that even though these two waters looked the same, they aren't the same. One is a lot more healthy for you. Yeah, this might be technically clean water, pure water, but it's acidic compared to this one. And in order to tell the difference, you have to have a tool to be able to discern the difference. You see, the Bible talks a lot about this. The Bible says that there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. There are uh, several different options that are presented uh, unto us that, that we think are great options for us. But the Bible says in the end thereof are the ways of death. Today I want to preach a message entitled to you, Decoding Discernment. How do we have the, the wisdom to make right decisions in our life? How many of you have ever made a wrong decision in your life? Raise your hand. How many of you wish you could go back and remake that decision? Raise your hand. Yeah, we all, okay? This is a, this is a message that's going to uh, hopefully minister to all of us today as we think about the great need for discernment in our life. Because listen, if it's true physically that we need to discern between two different glasses of water in front of us, then certainly there is a great truth spiritually for us that just because something looks good on the surface doesn't mean that it's actually good for you. Because deep down, it could be full of poison and death, or it might just not be the best choice before you. And so our lives, both physically and spiritually, are dependent upon us being good discerners between what is right and wrong and what is better and best. And so in many areas of our life, we are called to make choices. And that is the topic of this morning's sermon, is how do we through the power of a spirit-filled, led life, make wise choices in our life, okay? And so with that, our key text we read this morning was 1 John 4. Let's look back at it in just a few key verses here. 1 John 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. That word try is the Greek word in the original language, dokimadzo, and it means to test, to approve, to examine, to discern. What did we just do with these glasses of water? We tested them. We proved what their chemical makeup was. We proved that one had more potential of hydrogen than the other one did. One had a better alkalinity than the other one did. And so we tested that. They both looked the same on the surface, but when we got down deep, we saw that they were actually different. And the Bible says here that in the spiritual world, not everything that comes at you proclaiming to be from God is actually from God. Can I get an amen? I mean, when you watch Christian television, hello, not all of it is Christian. Not all of it is preaching the gospel. Just because a preacher looks nice in his suit and smiles really big and has 40,000 people attending his church doesn't mean that that's Christian. It can actually be anti-Christian. It can actually be deadly. 
And so the Bible says here, we must be aware of this. Believe not every spirit. Don't be gullible, Christian, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Now, how do we try the spirits? That's something I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the sermon today, as we'll wrap things up later. How do we uh, d- try the spirits? Because it says here, why should we try the spirits? Why should we be on guard? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Many people claiming to speak for God, to speak truth from God, but they're actually not of God. And so we've been called to test, to approve, to examine, to discern, to have wisdom, if you will. Look at verse 6. It says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. Now, in this context, John was saying there's, there's a couple of different tests that we're going to give. In fact, he's been addressing it the whole epistle. One of the biggest issues in the first century was uh, Gnosticism. And one of the tenets of Gnosticism was they believed that Jesus Christ didn't really come in the flesh. And so he says back there in 1 John chapter 4, verses uh, 2 through 5, I believe, he's talking about that test. Listen, if somebody comes from God and says that Jesus Christ never came bodily, he never appeared in human form, that person is not from God. But there's some other tests that he also brings up here. And here's an interesting one at the end of this passage that we read. He said, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that, no, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and error. Do you see the discernment here? John's saying, listen, here's how we know whether it's the spirit of error or the spirit of truth. Are you ready for it? He says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. And so today I want to just ask three questions and then seek to wrap it up with some application. The first question we're going to ask this morning is, what is discernment? What is discernment? And here's just a basic definition. Basically, discernment means the ability to judge well. Do you consider yourself a discerning person? A person who is able to discern truth from error, the spirit of truth, from the spirit of error. Uh, Discernment is the process of making careful distinctions in our thinking about truth in our lives. So discernment, to see things as they really are, to cut through the noise and the nonsense of all the errors and lies that are out there and to hear and recognize the truth. Isn't that what John says here? He says, listen, if you're discerning, you're going to hear us. You're going to agree with what we're preaching as the gospel full of grace and truth. You're, you're going to see God for who he really is and who is he really revealed as being. Well, he says here at the end of verse 8, God is love. And we'll come back to that thought here in a little bit. So discernment is that process of making careful distinctions in our thinking about truth. In reality, what discernment is, is wisdom. Wisdom. Do you have wisdom? Discernment and wisdom are synonymous. Now, one of the greatest examples of wisdom in the Bible, and I say that a little bit of tongue-in-cheek, because... uh, Well, let's talk about him. King Solomon. How many of you remember King Solomon, right? Solomon was known as the wisest man on earth before Jesus, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, and, and, And Solomon was approached by God, and God said, Solomon, I will give you anything that you ask for. And we know that Solomon asked for wisdom. 1 Kings 3, verse 9, the Bible says, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern, there's that word, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this, thy so great a people. Now the reason I mention Solomon kind of tongue-in-cheek is because Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines. You know, we're coming up to an election and some people want to play the moral card and say that we shouldn't vote for one candidate because he's been divorced three times. Have you looked at Solomon? It's amazing how we elevate Solomon and say, wow, Solomon really loved the Lord. Solomon was a really great guy. No, Solomon was just a guy guy who got captivated by the grace of God. 300 wives, let's be honest to the text. 300 wives, 700 concubines, Solomon wasn't a good guy. He wasn't your moral poster boy that you preach about in Sunday school and say, boys and girls, be like Solomon when you grow up. No, no. But here's what's fascinating. Solomon was given wisdom. 
Now, of course, the lady would chime in and say, yeah, he was married to 300 wives. Of course he was wise. But anyway, Solomon was given wisdom, okay? He was given wisdom. Now, why do I bring up Solomon? I'll just go ahead and share it with you. Because Jesus says in Matthew 12, 42, one greater than Solomon is standing here. And he was talking about himself. And Jesus isn't a polygamist. He's married to one bride. And guess where Jesus now lives? In you, if you're a believer in Christ. So Solomon, as great as he was, as wonderful as he was in his earthly wisdom, in fact, there's a fascinating story there in 1 Kings 3 after he asked for this wisdom. He's able to judge between two mothers who had had supposedly given birth to newborn babies. One had died, and the mother whose baby had died, she had switched the baby in the middle of the night, and he had a wise answer for how to discern between who was telling the truth and who wasn't. But the point is not Solomon, but the reason I bring him up is to show you that even Solomon was searching for wisdom. Solomon was granted wisdom, but we, I would argue, as Christians in the new covenant of grace, have a greater wisdom than Solomon. In fact, look with me at Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. It's not on the screen, but I, I just want to share it because it's something that was rolling around in my head. It says in, in Colossians 2, verse 3, uh, talking of Christ, it says of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why do we preach the finished work of Jesus? Why are we so hung up on the gospel? Because Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 and 23, no, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1 verses 23 and 24 that we preach Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So discernment, what is discernment? It's the ability to judge well. It's the ability to make careful distinctions about truth in your thinking. Discernment is not just about choosing between good and evil, but it's also about choosing between better and best in your life personally. So that's what discernment is. The ability to make wise decisions to tell what's coming at you, whether it's of the truth or whether it's from the spirit of error. So that's what discernment is. Number two, why do we need discernment? Why do you and I need it? Well, in the illustration of the water, we need it because we're in danger of taking in the wrong thing and it either making us sick or even killing us, correct? And so why do we need discernment? Well, for our spiritual health and the health of others. But why do we need discernment? Because there are so many voices in the world today. Which one do you listen to? Which one captures your attention? Which one demands your loyalty? Which one causes you to obey and to follow? Why do we need discernment? Because there's so many voices in the world today. Number one, the false teachers. We see that here in 1 John chapter 4. John said, beware of these false teachers. Do not believe every spirit, but try the spirits. Why do we need discernment? Why why is discernment demanded for a Christian? Why is it essential? Because of false teachers. Not everything that claims to be good actually is good. False teachers. How many of you would be transparent enough to say that you at some point in your life have been misguided by a false teacher? Yeah. It's dangerous, isn't it? Boy, it sounds so good on the, on the forefront. And, and listen, we're going to talk here in a moment about the book of Galatians and how these Judaizers came into to the church of Galatia. And it sounded good on the surface. I mean, who doesn't want to be a better boy and girl? Who doesn't want to behave better? That sounds good, but Paul, Paul was going to say, No, Galatians, do not be bewitched. Do not be deceived. Discern. That's what John's saying here. Discern. Why do we need discernment? Because of false teachers. And listen, that is your individual calling as a believer in Jesus Christ to always discern the teaching that you receive from this ministry. If you've got a question about what's being taught from from, from this platform, what's being shared, oh, I invite you to come and ask me questions and protect me because maybe I'm being led astray. You know what? I'm human. That can happen to me. And so we're a body of believers, of brothers and sisters in Christ if we're saved. and, And so false teachers, and we can even become our own false teachers if we're not careful. So that's why we need discernment. Number two, we need discernment because of the self-proclaimed authorities that are out there today. You know, everybody's a theologian today. You know why? Because they've got Google. And they've got social media. How many of you are just blessed on a daily basis by the internet theologians that we have now today? 
and the people who are experts in politics and experts in everything, right? And it's amazing, you know, it's it's just like the noise level keeps on rising over social media. And it's like we have all these self-proclaimed authorities today. And in fact, you can buy a, uh, you can buy a degree online now. 300 bucks and you got your PhD, brother. Woo! Self-proclaimed authorities. Why do we need discernment? Because not everybody that has THD, PhD, or MDIS or whatever, NCIS after their name, is is, is an authority. Remember that, young people, when you go off to college. Just because a prof, a professor, has a PhD after their name doesn't mean they're smarter than you in some areas. Can I just speak very plainly and say that any person who has a PhD after their name that thinks that we have uh, evolved from a rock is not playing with a full deck. I'm trying to be kind. So, young people, when you go off to college, whether it's a Christian college or not, be discerning. Just because a professor holds an academic advantage and a psychological advantage over you because he or she is the teacher doesn't mean they're right. And just because I say something from this platform and really teach it with conviction doesn't mean I'm right. Test the spirits. Prove it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. People have come to me in this church before over the last two and three years, and they have told me an area where maybe I need to study more. And you know what? They were right. How foolish for any of us to believe that we are at the end of the revelation of truth. How prideful for us. No, we are all students. And young people, always be a student. Don't take somebody's word. Boy, remember that so well. Please, I beg you. So we have these self-proclaimed authorities today. We have false teachers. Why do we need discernment? Because of those two reasons. But but thirdly, we need discernment when we choose companions in life. Man, one of the most important choices you will ever make in your life is to be discerning in the area of relationships. Whether that's friends or whether that's a future spouse, be discerning. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. He that walketh with discerning men, you could put that word in there. I told you the word synonymous. Shall be discerning, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Parents, we need to be discerning with our children. We need to look out for them. I'll just share a personal story here for a second. Growing up, I was around 12 or 13 years old, and I started hanging out with a dude from school. Um, I I was still in public school at that time, and I was hanging out with a guy who was not a good influence on me. You remember, Mom? I'm thankful for a mama who put her foot down on this boy in love. Because if I had still been around that friend for another several months or years... I don't know where I'd be today, but he was not a good influence on my life. In fact, through that friend, I was exposed to things that to this day I still battle with because of that friend. Young people, I just you just heard me talk to your parents. They need to be discerning with you. But young people, you need to trust your parents' discernment. They birthed you, or they uh, redeemed you, they they adopted you. We have several adopted families in our church, too, which is really neat. I love it. No better picture of grace and the finished work of Jesus than that. But think about the unconditional love of your mommy and your daddy. Stop giving them a hard time when they say, you know what? I don't want you to go out and hang out as much with that friend. Still be friendly to them, but you're not going to be best friends with them. They might know a little bit more than you. They might be a little bit further along in the uh, experience of life. And so I say that to all these young people. Trust your parents' discernment. They love you. They want the best for you. And all the parents said, amen, preacher. That's right. You see, Samson was a guy who didn't listen to his parents' discernment. How many of you remember the story of Samson? He had everything going for him, man. He was the captain of the football team. He could do anything. And he thought he was smarter than everybody, too. That's typical of 
young people. Judges 14, 3 says, Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren? Now, were, were uh, um, uh, Manoah and his wife being racially bigoted? No. This isn't an issue of marrying within the same skin color or ethnicity. The reason was is because she was a Philistine. And the Philistines were pagan idol worshipers. And, and, and Samson's mom and dad did not want... Samson marrying a pagan idol worshiper. Guess why? Duh. Because the hearts of those daughters will turn away the hearts of the sons. Deuteronomy. And so Samson said unto his father, Get her for me! Boy, he sounds entitled. Yep, he thought he was entitled and he got her. And he got a lot more than he bargained for. Young people, if you're in doubt... Lean upon the safety of people who love and care for you the most. Why sacrifice such a permanent relationship with those who love you unconditionally, with someone who very well may not be around tomorrow? Discernment. Why do we need it? Because of false teachers. Because of self-proclaimed authorities. Because of choosing companions in life. We need discernment. Listen, discernment is essential if we're going to avoid the ditches that await to ensnare and entrap us on both sides of the road of life. It's essential because we're going down that highway of life, but on the both sides, right or left, there are ditches we can get stuck in. And that's no fun being in a ditch. And so we need discernment. What, what are some signs of, of discernment? Um, as you think about why we need it, one of the essential reasons that we need discernment is because it's a sign of maturity. It is a sign of growing in your walk with Christ. Are you more discerning today than you were this time last year or five years ago or ten years ago? Are you growing in wisdom? Um, Ephesians 4 verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know one of the signs of a spiritually immature person is? Is they're carried about with every wind of doctrine that comes along. Every new teaching that comes along. Every new book that's out there, they, uh, they get caught up with Christian celebrity. So the Bible says here, don't be carried about, don't be tossed to and fro by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Why do we need discernment? Because it's a sign of spiritual maturity in our life. Hebrews 5.14 says, strong meat. Man, why do we try to give you steak on a Sunday morning? Why do we try to give you strong meat to chew on? Why sometimes do I give you a piece of meat that's maybe a little tough and you got to chew on a little extra? Why? Because strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How do you exercise your senses biblically? Getting in the book. Getting in, the word, getting in the Word, having a heart that's receptive through prayer and saying, God, lead me and guide me into all truth, for it is in knowing the truth that I'm set free. Error leaves me in bondage. Truth sets me free. And if the Son makes me free, I shall be free indeed. Have you experienced the freedom of truth lately? Oh, it's a sign of maturity. Why do we uh, need discernment? Because one of the signs of a maturing Christian is their ability to discern and make judgments. Not on what someone else says, but based upon what the Bible says and their understanding of God's Word. And I'll say this. One of the greatest marks of maturity in your life is realizing you still have lots to learn. I have coined a phrase recently. I don't know if it's original with me. I think it is. Uh, uh, but there's a phrase I've been telling a lot of people lately. I've, I've been telling people, the more I learn... The less I know, but the more at peace I am. What does that mean? The more I learn about God, the less I feel like I know about God. You know why? Because he gets bigger. He gets greater. He gets more incomprehensible to my understanding. The more I learn about God, the less I know. But strangely enough, the more at peace I am. The more at rest I find myself. I can't explain that, but just to say that can only come from somewhere outside of me. And I would submit to you that grace, great peace have they 
which love God's word. There's a peace. There's a tranquility. So why do we need discernment? Because it's a sign of maturity, but that really leads us into this second point. It's a necessity for stability. I just got done telling you, the more I learn, the the, the less I feel like I know, but the more at peace I am. How is that possible? Because God's truth, even though it's so big, our minds can't contain it, it settles and stabilizes our hearts. It, It anchors our thoughts. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. Listen, I can trust in a God that's bigger than me. I can trust that a God can somehow take the broken pieces of my messed up life and decisions and my guilt and my shame and he can turn ashes into beauty, a tragedy into a triumph. Only God can do that. Only God can raise the dead. So welcome. If you feel like you're dead this morning, you're right where God needs you to be. He can raise the dead. Only God can do that. And so why do we need discernment in our life? Because it's a mark of maturity. But number two, it's a sign, it's it's a necessity for stability. James 1.8 says it this way. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know what some of us need to finally do as it comes to the gospel and the finished work of Jesus? We need to finally come to a decision about it. Some of us, we keep hearing it. It's like, I'm not sure. Hey, test the spirits. Try it with the word of God. Rightly divide between the old and the new. See what Jesus did for us through the cross. See why reading the word of God with a Christocentric hermeneutic is vitally important. And you might be Christocentric. Listen to it. Write it down. Google it. Study it. Why do we read the Bible? We read the Bible to discover more about Jesus. That's what that basically means. We read the Bible to know more about him. We do not read the Bible primarily to figure out how how, how we can self-improve ourselves. The Bible is not a self-improvement manual. The Bible is the revelation of the love of an eternal God for unlovely people and how Jesus came as the hero of human history and he paid it all. He conquered all and now he's to be our all in all. Read it. You see, it's stability. Jesus Christ gives to us despair. Stability. He is our wisdom. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What are you double-minded about today, brother and sister? At some point, there has to be a a, a, a line, right? You remember Joshua? Joshua said, listen, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. But at some point, you have to cross the Rubicon River and don't look back. For them, it was the Jordan River. Cross the river. Step out in faith, believing in God's grace that it is all that we need, that it's more than enough. Necessity for stability. Why do we need discernment? Because of all these voices, false teachers, self-proclaimed authorities. We need wisdom in choosing our companions in life. This is a sign of uh, maturity. It's necessary for stability. But then finally we ask this question, how do we get it? How do we then get discernment? Is it something we can buy at the church in the Christian bookstore? I would like one discernment, please. Is that how that works? Boys, Americans, we'd like to think it does. You know, I just, okay, yeah, I'm going to get it today. Is that how it works? Let me give you three things of how we get discernment. Number one, we faithfully ask God for it. They're in that same passage in James that I just quoted from, James 1.8. Go back a few verses to verse 5, and God says this. If any of you lack wisdom or discernment, let him ask. So you know what I've been doing? I've been saying, God, your spirit was given to me to lead me and to guide me into all truth, John 16, 13. And I believe that it is your will that you reveal to me the truth as it really is. And that's really what the truth is. The truth is reality as it really is. When you tell the truth, you're telling things as they really are. Who Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it here in a second. Truth as it really is. So if you lack it, if you lack wisdom, I dare you, ask God. Faithfully ask. How many of us would, would, would say, you know, Brian, I, I've, I don't know the last time I asked God for wisdom. I feel like I've got enough. I'm good. No, see, the idea is to keep on asking because the word let him ask is in the Greek present tense, which means a continual idea. Keep on asking. We never stop. You know, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Yeah, he did. So keep on asking. And what does the Bible say? God will give it to him. 
Don't stop growing in wisdom, which brings us to the second point. How do we get it? Number one, faithfully ask. Number two, humbly receive. If God gives it, guess what? you got to receive it. And here's the rub. A lot of times we ain't too receptive, are we? Uh-uh. Be honest. How many of us have been approached by our parents or by somebody who we know loves us trying to teach and instruct us, rebuke us in a loving way, and we are like... Pop your head like a pimple. I am unteachable. I know better. You don't know what you're talking about. We question their motives. We say, oh, that's not going to work. It might have worked for you, but it won't work for me. But the point is, if you ask... God's going to give it, but he might not give it in the way that you want it. See, he's a good father. He knows how you need it. Are you receptive? Proverbs 9 verse 9 says something fascinating. It says, give instruction to a wise man, and guess what? He'll be yet wiser. Uh, Teach a just man, and, and guess what? He will increase in learning. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. You know why? Because he was teachable in his humanity. The Bible says he learned obedience. What? Really? See, this is where, boy, this is where the rub, and I can see it. I can see it all. This is where the battle of the will takes place. You got to receive it. Are you teachable? Are you able to be instructed? You see, the Bible continues over in the book of James. It says, the wisdom from above is what? It's peaceable. It's easy to be entreated. It's without hypocrisy and partiality. Man, that's good. That is good. that's, That's the wisdom we're looking for, to humbly receive it from God. How do we get wisdom? Faithfully ask. Two, humbly receive. Thirdly, diligently read. Turn with me quickly to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, that's over there in the New Testament uh, after the uh, book of 1 and 2 Corinthians and some other epistles there. 2 Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor, about 35, 36 years of age. So I identify well with Timothy at this stage of life. And Timothy was being written a letter to by his mentor, the Apostle Paul, which again reiterates Timothy had a mentor who helped him grow in wisdom and discernment. And Paul says over in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, uh, he says in verse, let's see, verse 13. This isn't on the screen, so just look there in, in a copy of the Bible. Uh, if, if, if you didn't bring one, pull out an app or, or look on with somebody. It says in verse 13 of 2 Timothy 3, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there's the context again. Why do we need discernment? Because of that right there. So what was Paul's answer to that? Verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. The sentence doesn't end there. It keeps going. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What is the primary way that we will acquire wisdom into our life? It is as we read the Word of God and the Holy Spirit reads us and He teaches us. He instructs us. He will instruct thee in the way which thou shalt go, but only if you're willing to receive it. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit's voice is a still small voice. You know the problem with that is, is that we can easily tune God out. We can easily crank up the noise of the world and listen to the noise of the world more than the still small voice of God speaking to us through his word. Again, what is wisdom? It's discernment. It's the ability to divide truth from error. error. What was Timothy, a young pastor's only hope of being discerning? Remembering what he had studied in the word. 
Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any scalpel, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The word of God has a spiritual, supernatural quality to it that it can divide, it can discern in areas that you can't even imagine, to the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what's our relationship been like with the Word of God? Have we gotten into the Word to not just see words on a page, but to see the mind of God behind the words, the message that He's communicating? Are you tuned in to the broadcast channel that God's broadcasting from? You see, the great danger in churches today is that God can be broadcasting His pure, undiluted truth but we might not even be hearing it. If it was possible for the Pharisees and scribes to have Jesus literally standing in front of them and not to see him as the Messiah, then it's definitely possible for Jesus in the Spirit to walk in these doors and us not even recognize him. Are you diligently giving yourself to the study of God's Word? Why do we have small groups? You know, why do we do that small group thing after our morning service? So that you can go deeper in the Word. And so... I really challenge you over the next couple of weeks to get a part of a small group. Grow in relationships. One of the greatest ways that we grow in our understanding of the Word is to share it with one another. Acts chapter 2 says that they grew daily sharing God's Word with one another. Beautiful picture of koinonia, of fellowship. But I want to argue this. You know, we've talked about a lot today. We've talked about needing discernment in relationships, discernment because of the false teachers, and many other areas of life. Listen, you also need discernment in, in choosing the best job for you, choosing where your family's going. I mean, there's so many ways that this applies. But here's the greatest need for our hour, I believe, as we seek to apply this message to our life. John, of course, references false teachers here in 1 John chapter 4, which was our key text this morning. But Paul elaborates on this false teacher uh, angle in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 6. The Bible says this, Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, meaning they would twist it, they would distort it. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. Whoa! So you're saying that even, even this angel could appear and this person could have a vision and claim to have a new revelation from God? And, and, and claim, Paul says, even if a quote-unquote angel, even if there's miraculous signs and wonders around it, make sure that you test it. Test the spirits. Let him be accursed if he's preaching another gospel. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, you have received, let him be accursed. Paul would go on to say in Galatians 3 verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who's deceived you that you should not obey the truth? There it is again. What's the truth? As it really is. You have not obeyed the truth as it really is. What's the truth as it really is? That it's all of grace and none of works. What were the Galatian Judaizers trying to do? They were trying to add back in works to salvation and works to sanctification. That's the context of, these, of this verse right here. Continue to read verses 2 and 3 and you'll see that. Paul says over in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 23 and 24. Oh, there it is. He says, the preaching of Christ crucified is the wisdom of God. Which sets up this point, and that's this. The greatest need for discernment, the greatest application of discernment we will ever exercise, I believe, in our lives is when we accurately identify and magnify the gospel as it really, truly is, full of grace, all about Jesus. Amen. Full of grace, all about Jesus. You might say, what's your biblical foundation for that? I'm glad you asked. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, there's that word truth again, very important, 
was, came by Jesus Christ. As you study the original language here, what, what the writer is saying, what God is saying, I believe this with all of my heart, he's saying this, the law was given by Moses. And of course, compare Scripture with Scripture. I would invite you to compare this Scripture with Galatians 3, verses 19 through 25. Compare it. Because the, because the Bible says the law was ever only temporary. It was given, it was added because of transgressions till the seed. Who's the seed? Galatians 3.16. It's Christ. So the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth. Now here's how a lot of people misinterpret this verse. They say, oh, God's a balance of grace and law. No. Notice where the but is and notice where grace and truth is. It's on the other side of the but. You know what a lot of churches do today? They say, God saves you by grace. But, if, and, all the caveats, all the carrots, all the sticks, and we mix in and we think, all we're doing, we're thinking, oh, we're helping God out. We're balancing. No, Paul says it's mixture and it's deadly. Galatians 5, 9. So the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth. Now you might say, but pastor, grace and truth. Didn't Jesus in his earthly ministry teach grace, but he also gave truth? I mean, he went in and turned the money changers' tables over, right? Yeah. He was zealous for God's house. He had a zealous love for God's house. A zealous love for the people that they wouldn't be deceived into thinking they could buy their salvation. But the word truth there is the Greek word alethanos. It's a unique Greek word. You know what John's literally saying? And guess who John was? John was the beloved disciple. John was the same writer of 1 John that we just, that was our text this morning where John said, God is love. John said, he is full of grace and truth. The word truth means as it is in reality. As it really is. You know what John was saying? He was saying, listen, we have the final revelation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. We beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. I don't know if that verse is there, guys. John 1, 14. If you can find that, I don't know if it's on there. Uh, if it's not, that's okay. But John 1, 14. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. There it is. Full of grace as it is in reality. What the, literally, what the original language is saying is, we have thought that this is how God was because in the law and the prophets, there were shadows, there were pictures. We didn't get a full idea of who God is. But the Bible says in multiple witnesses that when Jesus came, we now have a full revelation of who God is. What did Jesus say to Philip? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. Full of grace as it is in truth. There have been books written that says, no, no, see, grace and truth, truth means law. No, it doesn't, because if it did, then the same word would have been used in John 1, 17, but it wasn't. What John is saying is, you know what? We've seen reality. We've seen a lathanos as it truly is. Jesus is full of grace. Notice it says in John 1, 16, and of his fullness have we all received and grace. Now, see, Let's study the word, right? If it was a balance between grace and truth, then why didn't John follow up verse 14 with saying, and grace plus truth, you know, balance? No, he said, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. You think you can put grace in a box. You think that where sin abounds, grace won't abound. But no, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Get ready. We're going to worship God for all of eternity because we're going to finally see... Wow. Wow. You mean He loved me then? You mean He loved me when I was... Beyond hope? Yeah. You mean he saw me there? Yes. But we think, you know, the religious, fleshly, carnal mind thinks, if you preach grace upon grace, people are going to abuse it. Well, you have electricity and people abuse that. Right? I mean, why do we let... Oh, we're going to talk about fear. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Why do you let fear dictate your theology? 
God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And oh, there it is again. What does discernment do? What does the gospel do? It gives to us a sound mind. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The two greatest questions you can ever answer in your life is, what is the character and nature of God as he is fully revealed in Jesus Christ? And who am I now because I am in Christ? Those two questions, when you answer them with the word, changes your life. God is love, the Bible says here in 1 John 4, 8. It goes on to say, 1 John 4, 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know what the great message of the gospel is? Fear not good news. John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. John, who wrote about Jesus being full of grace and truth, grace upon grace, God is love. That same same disciple had an encounter with the resurrected Savior of the world in Revelation 1.17. And John fell at his feet as dead. And Jesus came over to him and touched him and said, Fear not. Fear not. The angel said, fear not, shepherds. Why? Because I bring you good tidings of great joy. Behold. Behold. See it. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. You see, Christianity's first call is not behave. It's behold. We're so scared that if we preach this gospel the way that God truly reveals it in His Word, that people won't behave. Guess what? You can't change people. I'm a parent. I know this. You can't make kids behave. Maybe for a certain time, scare them half to death. But sooner or later, they become teenagers and they know that you can't make them. Oh, yeah, you can make their life miserable, but you can't change their heart. And why do we as ministries double down on a dead religion that says we can change people's hearts with more rules and more behavior-centered theology? It's wrong. It's so, it's so absent of the gospel. Because Christianity's first call from beginning to end is behold, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Really? Yeah, God hath not given us the spirit of bondage again to fear, Romans 8, 15 says. What we have received, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Boy, that word Abba communicates an intimacy, a closeness. Let me ask you a question. How close do you feel that you are to God right now? Well, Pastor, I really don't feel that close. Good. I'm, 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 I'm kind of glad in a way that you're honest and you say that because you know what? Feelings, first of all, don't determine facts. A lot of us live a feeling-centric theology and we allow feelings to interpret the Word of God for us. And so we say, well, I feel dirty. Well, I don't feel close. Listen, when you understand the Lamb of God and what He did in the shedding of His blood, you will know after that fact, after you receive that fact humbly, you will know that nothing can ever make you closer to the side of God than what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for you. Ephesians 2.13 says we are made nigh Not by our good behavior, not by our faithful attendance record, not by our good giving. No, we do not denigrate the blood of Jesus. We are made nigh by one thing, the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise to Yeshua, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's who we magnify. What's the purpose of this message? For you to go out of here with a list of 10 behaviors? No, for you to, at the end of this message, say, wow, I have a God that I have yet to fully understand and I worship him humbly. And I say, wow, God, I actually am complete in you. I'm going to ask my wife to come and get that song ready. We're going to sing it as we close our service today. Because that song says, 
We are complete. Do you believe that? Well, I don't feel that way. doesn't matter. The gospel fact is, the Bible says, you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. So how do we apply this message? The greatest need in our churches today is to proclaim the pure, undiluted, living water of the gospel of grace. Anything else will leave the church sick and the world thirsting for something more. Jesus said to that woman of Samaria, a woman who, by the way, had had five husbands, and the current guy she was living with wasn't her husband. You know what he said to her? He said, listen, lady, I lost it. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I want to finish with a story, and I hope I don't embarrass this person today, but my sissy. I love my daughter. My daughter, Caitlin, many of y'all know her. She sings on um, Sunday mornings a lot. And Parents, isn't it encouraging to your hearts when your kids catch things that you didn't realize they were catching from you? Um, I was talking with my daughter, and she had actually talked with my wife, and um, my daughter has been listening to my preaching and she's heard some preaching all across uh, d- different resources d- different areas and, and we got into a great talk the other day and she said you know what dad I listened to some of the preaching out there and, and, and some of the preaching is I don't think you would like it too much dad why do you say that Caitlin because the preaching isn't focused on Jesus It's focused on scaring us and dad, and she even said this. She said, dad, I think they've gotten discipleship and salvation mixed up. You know what I did in my heart? I was like, yes, praise God. Because if there's one thing that I hope my daughter doesn't grow up with, it's the demons of doubts that I was haunted with growing up. In a church that, yes, did their best that they could, but they preached a mixed gospel, a gospel that caused me to continually look inward. If I had done enough, did I believe enough? Did I understand enough? Man, do you see that with the thief on the cross? Do you see that with the Philippian jailer? Do you see that with these people? These people didn't have a theology degree before they got saved. And how dare preachers confuse the gospel but I'm thankful for a young for a group of people who are growing up who are hearing as best as I can and I'm going to fail too but as best as I can to preach the gospel hold on to that because not every person that gets up and proclaims to be an authority from God is preaching the gospel what is the gospel it is simply this you're a sinner who needs a savior and the good news is there was one person who qualified as the savior he came as you he lived apart from you in fact in the fact that he was sinless not as you but then he became you so that you could be made him he died for you he was buried for you he rose from the grave for you but here's something fascinating he died as you on the cross all of your sin was exchanged to him you, he, he put your robes of sin upon him, your guilt and your shame, and he put his robes of righteousness on you, thus finalizing that beautiful type from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. He took your fig leaves of self-righteousness trying to hide your shame, and he hung there in shame before the world, and he took his coat of righteousness and placed it on you. You might say, man, oh, I've heard this, Pastor. We cannot be so familiar with the gospel that we cause to not, that we cease to worship. We're complete in Him. Do you have discernment, Christian? Are you discerning? Is God speaking to your heart? Let's stand together as we sing this song as a hymn of worship, an invitation. If God is speaking to your heart, oh, make a decision. But see, with discernment, it's not just a one time decision, but it's a decision to say, oh, I'm on a daily. I'm going to receive this. For some of us, maybe it's to finally receive the good news of the gospel, to really believe this by faith. For by grace are you saved through 
faith. Faith activates what God has given. Faith is the hand that receives what God is holding out. So exercise faith, worship in faith as we sing complete in Christ. If, if you need ministry this morning, if you need someone to pray with, we have workers at the back three doors. I'm here as well. Um, let's just sing this song. Brother Matthews, would you come and lead this for us? Complete in thee, no work of mine. If you need prayer, if God's working your heart, I would love to pray with you just to talk with you. Listen to the Spirit's leading as we sing this song. Let's sing the first and the last together. It says, complete in thee, no more shall sin. The only hope for getting free from the dominion of sin is to no longer be under the law, but to be under grace. Romans 6, 14. Write it down. Memorize it. All I'm telling you is Bible. Complete in thee, no more shall sin. You want freedom from sin? Believe that there's nothing you can do to lose God's love. And I guarantee you, watch your life change. Ready? Let's sing it. Complete in thee, no more shall sin. Father, thank you so much that we are complete in you, that our hope of being delivered from the power of sin is to understand that we have been delivered to be under grace. And Father, I pray that we would exercise discernment in every area of our life, but certainly, God, as believers, that we would discern what is the true gospel and what is a mixed-up gospel or no gospel at all. Father, I pray that we would see that a gospel that tries to water down the good news of grace is no gospel at all. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be discerning, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you for the guests that have been here today. Thank you for this wonderful time of worship. And now, Father, we pray you bless as we are dismissed to our small groups. We ask it in Jesus' name. All God's people said... Amen. I don't believe I have too many announcements. Just want to remind you about small groups that will be starting here in about five to ten minutes. If you're a guest